And we welcome you to Journey into Faith. As you view this program, it will be Thanksgiving in America. But wherever we are in the whole world, it is a time to give thanks. So we thank God for each of you that have joined us on Journey into Faith. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we do, we do thank you for each one, Father, in all the countries of the world practically who are tuning in to hear your word. It is not our word that we preach. It's the word of God Almighty through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us, Lord God, as we deal with the whole subject of commitment to you to cause us to want to commit every part of our life to you in grateful thanksgiving for all that you do for us. Now bless, Lord God, this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now we're going to have a married couple, uh, Julie and Bob Eli, sing for us a song about Thanksgiving. It is, tell, it is entitled, excuse me, My Heart is Full of Thankfulness. My heart is Praise the Lord. My heart is filled with thankfulness. Is yours. Mine is. Is yours. We've got so much to be thankful for. I'd like to sing a song about Jesus right now. It's entitled, I'd Rather Have Jesus. <laughs> I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands. 
than to be a king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be a king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have my Jesus than anything old world of forts today. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out of the all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have my Jesus and let him lead than to be a king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd much rather have my Jesus than anything this old world of forts today. I'd rather have Jesus than any anything. Right now, Bob's going to come up and he's going to read the scripture to us. Bob. Starting with Proverbs 16.3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. And Psalm 37, 1 through 7. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. 
Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. And 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. As Pastor Horn comes forward to preach this message titled, Faithful in Our Commitment, we just ask that you would grant that we would be faithful in our commitment to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Bob. You may be seated. The Christian commitment is like a race. We are to simply run the race with patience, but run the race. There are fresh, eager faces out there who want to hear truth. They're looking for truth. And I have noted that little revivals are springing up in different areas of our world. People want truth. They do not want something they know isn't true at all because everything is denied in what they have peddled in this world for us as truth. Time after time, the Bible turns our attention to God's faithfulness to us and how because of that faithfulness that we experience with our God, we should be committed to him wholly. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has created you, and he is trying to do a good work through all of his servants. The word of God says it's not a bad word. It's a good work that God is using each one of us for. It is God's faithfulness to us that undergirds and empowers our faithfulness to God. He loves us. We love him back. He's faithful to us, and it teaches us how to be faithful to him. But faithfulness to Christ, my friends, and our service to him is something that just doesn't come until we are sold out to Jesus Christ. Faithfulness to God comes not only when we know how faithful he is to us, but in return, we want to be faithful to his desires for our lives. The Bible reminds us <clears throat> that it is a requirement of every Christian to trust in the Lord with all their hearts. What are four different things that characterize faithfulness? The first is joy. When a person is faithful to God, there's a joy in them, even if they come here at two in the morning. There is a joy because they know, and I knew, I was serving God and the body of Jesus Christ. And the reality of that service, even at that ungodly hour, gave me joy. And I thank God for it because the Holy Spirit would lead me. Faithfulness without joy becomes drudgery. The psalmist said, and hear what he said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He had lost it. There are too many Christians that lose the joy of being a Christian. They come in with morose-looking faces. I mean, you ever seen a prune? That's how, how you look at some Christians that come in. Of course, nobody that's here tonight. But I can tell you, as you come in, people are looking at you, and they can tell whether you got the joy of the Lord or you have been sucking on prunes. The reality is, the psalmist lost his joy. And he said to God Almighty, the only one that could restore that joy, restore unto me the joy of 
thy salvation. When you lose your commitment to God, you lose your joy. And when you lose your joy, you don't attract anyone but flies. That's the reality. It goes on in that verse to say, and grant me a willing spirit. First of all, restore to me the joy that I've lost and give me a willing spirit to receive it. You know, God wants to restore everyone that's lost their joy. Joy in serving him. Joy in ministering to others. Even if nobody ministers to them, they have a joy in ministering to others. And therefore, if you don't have a willing spirit, God can't restore anything to you because you have decided, I don't want to go down that pathway any longer. So you do not have the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Think about that. There are weak Christians all over the place because they've lost their commitment to God in its full measure, and therefore they've lost their joy in serving God. They go to the services, but there's no joy in what they're hearing from the Word of God. There's no joy in serving the people of God. We have a different situation in this church. I see joy in serving others. But in a lot of churches, there is no joy. They just do it because they're expected to do it, and it's not with the right attitude. It goes on to say, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I cannot continue to serve God without the joy of the Lord as my strength. And that's why so many people have gone to church for a long time and then you don't see them. They've lost their commitment to God, first of all, and then they have lost their joy. And they come with that look on their face. Make me laugh if you can. You can't make a person laugh that doesn't have the joy of the Lord as their strength. We have an interesting man in this body, and he tells jokes. And I can tell you, if I didn't have the joy of the Lord, they wouldn't mean as much to me as they do. I listen to his jokes because I get the punchline. I get many times the joy from his countenance, and his way of putting them across. It goes on. When you have restored to me the joy of my salvation, when my commitment is where it should be, this is the end of that verse. Then will I teach transgressors your ways. People that are not where they ought to be with God, I can teach the ways of God but I can teach it with a joy and not with a dictatorship kind of attitude. And he says, and sinners will turn back to you. You know, you can uh, win a person to Christ with a smile more than a frown. Come to my church. I've received Christ as my Savior, and I'm really happy. That isn't going to win anyone to your church or to Jesus Christ. So if you don't have a joy in serving God anymore, ask him to restore it. It's a simple thing. God wants to give you a joy. He wants to give you a smile. I uh, told this as an example once in my uh, growing up church some of the ladies had so much thick mascara on, rouge on, and when they moved, it flaked off. That brought me as a kid much joy. I don't know what the pastor said, but I do know I wanted to sit right where these ladies were. They had big hats and thick, thick rouge. And uh, it was a joyful situation. <laughs> That did not win me to Christ, but it gave me a joy when I went to church. 
I got the joy of the Lord when I started listening to God instead of sitting there with my folks. They would always sit there. It wasn't my fault. They would always sit in that same seat. You know, there are some people, if they had to move from the pew they're in, they would false, They would say, I'm not going to church anymore. In fact, I had a dear saint of God that's now with the Lord. We roped off a part of the back, and she said, I'm not coming anymore unless you unrope it. So we unroped it, and I tried to shout a little louder. <laughs> but... It isn't the pew you're in. It's the anointing that you receive that's important. If you receive it at the end, that's good. At the last pew, wonderful. But if you receive it only toward the middle or the front, then don't be a stubborn mule. Move where the anointing begins to reach you. I tell the story about my mother. She would always sit in the back and she'd always criticize in one way or another the message. Then one day she had to sit in the front and she said, you've improved. It's the anointing. Wherever you sense the presence of God speaking to you in a message, then that's the place to be. But it is not just a sitting in church. It's a sitting in church and taking in what God has for you. And it will restore the joy of your salvation. Jesus said to his disciples, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I want to have full joy, don't you? I want to have a joy that I don't put on. It just is so good. We're going to have a shortened service here tonight, but I'm making use of coming and rejoicing in the Word of God even though we've had a hard day because I can't get enough of God's Word. And He speaks to me as He speaks to others. And it gives me the joy of the Lord. God wants us then to have full joy. Not a little bit of joy, but full joy. Nehemiah said, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord produced by the Holy Spirit of God is a supernatural joy that gives us what we need and helps us to endure you know, everybody that calls and they're morose, they need a good dose of joy. They don't need a lot of counsel. They just need to go to God and say, give me a joyful spirit again. I've lost it through the trials and tribulations I've gone through. The joy of the Lord produced by the Holy Spirit is something that takes us over and we begin to have a calm, calmness of spirit and a joy that is, it is attractive to people. Now, there was a, a woman running for president, and she had a false joy. She was always smiling. But behind that, I don't believe she was joyful. I'm talking about having genuine joy because Jesus Christ is all you need. Second, we need compassion. This means to suffer with one another. It means that when another person experiences pain or sorrow, we feel that pain or sorrow. The body of Christ is affected by each other's pain and sorrow or joy and laughter. When you rejoice, I, I want to rejoice too. When you're going through a trial, I want to try to meet your trial by prayer. And prayer is the most important thing. Throughout the Gospels, we read that Jesus was moved with compassion for the multitudes, for two blind men, for a leper, for a widow whose only son had died. He was moved with compassion. 
You have joy because the Lord has filled you, but you have compassion because you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself wept over the city of Jerusalem at the grave. He also wept at the grave of Lazarus, and he told of a good Samaritan who had compassion on a man. So much is indicated in this word. And I encourage you, I encourage you to sell out to Jesus if you haven't and let the commitment you have be total, which will result in you having the joy of the Lord. Now, before we end on Journey into Faith, I invite you to listen to Journey into Faith live as I preach it tomorrow during the day and you'll have the rest of this message. And there's much to come. You can tune in to my Facebook page anytime, Robert Hahn, and you will get the rest of this message. God bless you, because if you've got this much, you've got quite a bit. Until next week, God bless you special. Let's pray for the lost. Father, we just pray for anyone that's listening to us that has never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. How can they have the joy of the Lord without the Lord? Well, they can't. So, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work upon anyone that's listening to us that has never received Christ, that they will make that decision right now and receive you as their Lord and Savior. And I pray that the joy of the Lord will fill them and the commitment to your cause will be their cause. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray this prayer. Amen. If you have made a decision to receive Christ, I urge you to write our email address, rhonet2 at breezeline.net. Or write us at our street address in America. The Bible Speaks in Laconia, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246. Until next week, God bless you, and may you praise the Lord. <laughs>